basically this unit here, a four component net radiometer. This is measuring uh, short wave and long wave energy. On board is a battery that powers the unit that is used to transmit the data optically. Skin temperature of the surface. There's the chips which store the data. We have about, uh, about 180 temperature sensors located around the five county metro area, collecting data for about the last uh, three years, and we'll continue collecting data for at least another year, if not for the next five years. So what we're doing is we're monitoring uh, the greater Twin Cities area to examine the character of the urban heat island. We go out about every three or four months, we pick up the data, we come back and process it, and then we use that data to produce maps and to try to understand how our heat island behaves. We think of climate change uh, as being anything that's changing the climate. So in an urban area, we get warming from the greenhouse gas is what most people are familiar with, and then on top of it we get the, the gray infrastructure that we put in place of all that natural vegetation that was once there before we were there. And that, that gray infrastructure causes um, a much greater warming of the urban area. My name is Peter Snyder. I am an associate professor in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate at the University of Minnesota, and I study urban heat islands and climate change. Climate is the long-term average of the weather, so we would never look at an individual uh, day, individual month, individual year even, and say that that's indicative of climate change. Sometimes for certain uh, weather events, you don't know that it's climate change related until after it happens years later. We're starting to see things happening in the state, in particular things like how warm our winters are, changes in snowfall patterns, changes in the humidity of the atmosphere is quite noticeable, and then things like uh, extremes in precipitation are of quite a concern. As a citizen, um, I'm rather frustrated with the pace of change, and I think that's because I know what's going on from a scientist's perspective. We need to be doing more and more quickly. I think urban residents are, if they don't know the term heat island, they understand the phenomenon, they understand the effect. And not only can we make sense of that, but we can say, how do we change this? That this is not, not only is this an indication that we're changing the climate, but it also is an opening for us to say, how do we design our cities differently? And then I think once we start doing something about the heat island effect, it'll empower us to do things about a lot of other issues too. Peter's work is really interesting because he's actually making direct measurements in our metropolitan area, which has been really intensively studied. Now we've known about heat islands, that is buildings, roadways, and infrastructure can trap heat. So you get this bubble of, of slightly elevated temperatures near an urban area. And, and that is something that he sees in his data, but what he's also seen is that the general temperatures are increasing. It's sort of like uh, an, an ocean with a boat. There are waves on an ocean, so some parts are higher, some are lower, some are higher, some are lower, and that's like the heat island, warm local regions, but then the entire tide is rising. So you have this combined effect. And if you're planning on, let's say, human safety, human health, uh, dealing with heat stress in a city, you have to be concerned about the combined effect of global and regional climate change along with these local microclimates, which is what we call them. You heat things up and Minnesota has warmed about three degrees since the early 1800s. People say, well, what's the big deal, Paul? And I say, well, when's the last time you were three degrees warmer? You were running a fever and there were probably symptoms. And we're now seeing the symptoms of climate change showing up in Minnesota's increasingly erratic and volatile weather. The extremes are becoming more extreme. But I tell people, look, you can't dump 40 billion tons of man-made gases into the atmosphere and pretend that's not going to have an impact. It's a fairy tale. 
the kinds of industry that um, contribute to climate change, they not only emit greenhouse gases, but they also emit other co-pollutants um, when they function. And those co-pollutants have um, impacts for the communities that they are sited in. And those have also been largely been environmental justice communities. So when you deal with the most um, egregious kind of greenhouse gas emitters, you're also dealing with a whole set of other health um, issues that can be very important for a community.